Hello and welcome everyone to our reboot review. I'm Paul. And I'm Dave. Okay, and this week we're talking about four episodes, because they're allegedly a four-parter, but I don't really see how parts two and three connect, because maybe I missed something. Anyway, the episodes are Nullzilla and Gigabyte, which both aired in Canada on December 27th, 1995. And then we get Trust No One, which aired in Canada on January 25th, 1996. And finally, uh, Web World Wars, which aired in Canada on February 1st, 1996. Yeah. So that's not confusing at all. All right. So let's start off with big video games that released at the end of the year. Um, I think we've kind of talked about everything. Um... Yeah, I don't think there was anything else that we missed for this year, but we'll we'll move over to 1996. Mm, so the, the first question about how did this year decide to start off? Oh, Dave, it started with a bang. So we get up until February. So, uh, oh, there's some bangers here. Okay. Um, on the Saturn, there's a game called Guardian Heroes, which I'm not familiar with. It's like a 2D beat-em-up. Ah, uh, yes, I'm familiar with it. I picked up a downloadable version. I think I only cracked into it and played a little bit, but it fit well enough for a platformer. had a bit more of a fantasy style to it. Okay. Uh, also, on the Saturn, on the 26th, uh, you could pick up a game called Mysteria, the Realms of Lore, which is apparently a tactical RPG, which I'm not familiar with. Like, it rings a slight bell in my head, but it's probably just the case of I heard the name once before, but no recollection of it. Yeah, I, I, I don't think I've ever played a Saturn game in my life. I don't think. Hmm. Anyway, uh, moving on to oh, the one that got me all excited. January 29th. Dave, it's, it's, it's here. It's here. In the typical sense, or like... Oh man, it's here, it's here. It's here. It's January 29th, 1996. This little game called Duke Nukem 3D is released. Ah, uh, yes. It's Duke Nukem like I suppose, 3D. I suppose with the series as it kind of sits, would it be like the apex of the Nukem series with this game release? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, there's a bunch of Duke Nukem games you only really have to play Duke Nukem 3D. <laughs> no, that's understandable. Again, there was a decent rise when it was re-released at least a good year or so back, I believe it was. They've done a bunch of re-releases for it. Um, there was like a 20th anniversary one where it came out on PS4 and stuff. Um, play Duke Nukem 3D. Um... <laughs> And I almost want to tell people to play Duke Nukem Forever just because it's terrible. On but... the one hand, I wouldn't be surprised. Like, firstly, why would you submit someone to that torture? What's wrong with you, good sir? But additionally, it's also a marvelous case of the kind of... A multitude of don'ts of what to do with designing a game. Especially when it's from a franchise. It's... I... <sighs> I always think people should play it just because it's such a fascinating, it's such a fascinating game in like how to completely fuck up a franchise. That's fairly true with most of the things that I know of. Like on the one hand, I wouldn't be surprised that I maybe actually got my hands on a copy and supposedly played it, but whether or not I scrubbed that from my brain and burned the evidence in some sort of way, I cannot recall. Yeah, I don't think I've ever actually finished it, but I played a bunch of it on PC, and it's it's just, it's the greatest terrible game ever. Okay. Again, in those sort of cases, definitely kind of falls upon taste in certain sort of cases, especially with Dooku Nukem subject matters. Oh yeah, no, it's, it's, it's terrible, but it's also very funny. At, like, in that you're laughing at it, not laughing with it. Right, in those sort of cases. But anywho, uh, let's move on to other video game ideas before going down the Nukem uh, rabbit hole. Uh, the final one we have is a little game that came out on the Super Nintendo on January 31st. A little game called Mega Man X3. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, it's still a case that I'm not too familiar with the Mega Man series and how much they can kind of 
blend together, even with the X series. Yeah, I was never a Mega Man kid growing up, so uh, do not ask me about Mega Man. Nevertheless, the series is neat in its respect, and eh, supposedly here's hoping about whatever comes in the supposed future, but again, we'll have to see. Yes, indeed. Alrighty, so for uh, top music, I'm just going to go to 1996 and we'll go from there. Because uh, it's the same song that ended 1995. Any idea what that might be, Dave? I'll give you a hint. It involves boys to men again. On the one hand, not surprising, but also a mild case of not familiar enough with the band that actually know which one of their particular songs was up at the top. Aside from the obvious one. So it's actually not just boys to men. This is um, Mariah Carey and Boys to Men with One Sweet Day. Oh dear God, they're combining their powers. And they will rule the year. Uh, well, a chunk of the year. Yeah, supposedly. Again, living it around that time, there are faint memories, but nothing that would subscribe to, oh man, I listened to these particular songs, when really, I just listened to a bunch of particular songs on CD, on repeat. <laughs> All right, and for films, there's a couple of things that we're not really going to get to quote-unquote talk about that I want to bring up quickly that were at the Ooh. end of 95, because goddamn was the end of 95 a hell of a year, <laughs> or a hell of a time no, for films. that's film. understandable. Again, I suppose a way to start it with Ace Ventura, with most people being like, yeah, but a multitude of people being like, oh, dear God. Yeah, so after Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls, there was uh, number one the week after was this little film called Goldeneye. Yes, very much yes, which would start the revolution of the particular stuff that happened at around that time. Uh, following up from Goldeneye was this little movie called Toy Story. Ooh, that is a thing. Like, which was the date on that? Around in November or would that be in December? So Toy Story first took number one in November 26, 1995. Okay, because I have a vague thought on that, because that's kind of fits the time frame of things uh middle of december jumanji would take over number one. Oh yeah that's definitely a thing we're definitely cracking the nostalgic mindset of my childhood yes uh and then the uh christmas day weekend we would get this little film that you, uh, a film you've probably never heard of called waiting to exhale mildly intriguing but also the case of yeah, young child at the time, and just, like, possibly not even when in my wheelhouse. No, it definitely wouldn't have been. Um, and then for the last weekend of the year, uh, Toy Story would take back over the number one spot. Hooray for Toy Story. Good works. Yes. Uh, following up from that, we get into this little film for the beginning of January to the mid of January, kind of. Uh, this little film called Twelve Monkeys. Are you familiar with 12 Monkeys? I can't say that I am because it's getting confused with to too many particular films about monkeys. Oh no, th this movie isn't about monkeys. <laughs> no, it's just simply title things, but how my brain works, the one word and everything just comes flooding in. Yeah, it's a really great like science fiction uh, film. That involves like time travel and it's like this post-apocalyptic thing where this virus has wiped out almost all of humanity and it's it's very good interesting uh getting into the end of january so uh we have this little film called from dusk till dawn Ah, uh, yes i can't remember when it was but that's honestly been on my mind for the last couple of days yes it's a robert uh rodriguez quentin tarantino film and ooh, it's very very good and finally, the number one film at the box office for the week, uh, the third episode that we're talking about aired. Uh, any ideas what that could be? Around then, when that movie was released, the timeline... I don't think you'll get it, but I would... I mean, I guess you could, but this definitely wouldn't have been something you would have watched at the time. Mm, was it something that has picked up a decent cult following and has kind of had some relevancy in some way? And no, not really interesting because yeah nothing is immediately coming to mind uh it's a movie called uh mr 
Holland's Opus. Yeah, nothing coming along. But from the sounds of it, it's sounding like a particular uh, Oscar piece that someone tried to get along. Um, yeah, maybe yeah. kind of. Um, it, it did all right, like in terms of reviews, like it's 75% on Rotten Tomatoes. And it did okay at the box office, but it was never like, you know. Thing of the time, it's like at the moment, hmm, interesting film, decent concept. But after that, it was just kind of like, well, stick it on the shelf, keep on moving. Uh, yes, and for the week of the fourth episode, we have a different movie that became number one. Any idea what that might be, Mr. David? It's a comedy. More so, hmm. It's again, trying to think of the time. The, the only one thing that comes to mind is one of those typical rom com kind of romance films where the guy falls in love with the girl but doesn't know any of the particular things. The awkwardness and the silly situations that happen. As for the title of any of those particular ones I'm thinking of, I can't think of them, but that's the only thing that's coming to my mind. It is definitely it. not that. Hmm. It is a Chris Farley film called Black Sheep. On one hand, not surprising, but also on the other hand, not familiar with that particular film. Oh, Chris Farley and I think David Spade play brothers. And David Spade is supposed to, like, run for governor, I think. And then something happens where he can't, so Chris Farley has to or something. It's something like that. There, it's it's like a political comedy with Chris Farley and David Spade. On the one hand, that's not surprising, Again, this is kind of around the time when we had a movie with Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito. Oh, Twins is a great film, Dave. Indeed. I will hear nobody speak ill of Twins. Duly noted. <laughs> anyway, let's get into the episodes. So, yes, let's. The first episode is called. What's the first episode called? Nullzilla, which I almost yeah. mispronounced. But anyway. So we get this unusual creature that arrives from Hexadecimal's mirror and infects her, which causes thousands of nulls, including Megabyte's pet Nibbles, uh, to envelop Hexadecimal to protect Mainframe. In order to defeat Nullzilla, Fong sends Bob, Dot, Enzo, Mike the TV, Frisket, and Andrea into a giant mech robot to battle the monster. <laughs> which yeah. is totally not a ripoff of Power Rangers, which was incredibly popular at the time. No, no, what are you talking about? It's ridiculous. Like, the popular TV series from Japan that got the spin-off from the particular people coming over into the States wouldn't be a super popular thing for people to do a rip-off or sort of thing of. Yeah, this wasn't entirely designed to try and sell toys. <laughs> uh, Hexadecimal eventually goes back to normal after being defeated. Then the intruding uh, creature finds a new target, which is Megabyte. Yeah. So that's really all that happens in the first episode. I think that's important. Yeah, with all the particular bits there. Okay, so now we move on to the second episode, which is called Gigabyte, which aired on the same night, at least in Canada. Yes. Okay. So uh, the possessed Megabyte merges with Hexadecimal, creating a new virus called Gigabyte, who has a really cool design. Okay. Um, and also has a claw that's similar to, like, Freddy from Nightmare on Elm Street. Uh, I wouldn't say fam familiar, but at least kind of either having an homage or sort of similar style to it. Well, I mean, yeah, kind of, but I'm also thinking, like, there's a moment where he, like, scrapes it along the wall that was very Freddy to me. Oh, okay. Um, the mainframers fight to stop him gaining full strength alongside both Hack and Slash, and a returning mouse uh, in the battle against the new virus. So mouse comes back, which is super cool, because uh, I like mouse. Yes. Um, there's a biome who has his energy absorbed by Gigabyte, who uh, is based off of Indiana Jones. And I was like, mm -hmm. I like that because I like Indiana Jones. Mm -hmm. And Bob's uh, special body armor looks very much like something Solid Snake would wear. <laughs> yes. Also, Mouse uses this controller that looks shockingly uh, similar to a PlayStation controller. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Like, 
supposedly with the particular things at the time, it probably would be the easiest to kind of work with. Because, oh man, what would happen if it was a Nintendo 64 controller? Was the 64 out yet? Didn't that... Oh no, that came out in 95, didn't it? Yeah, at around that time. Okay, because I was thinking it might not have been, because I, for some reason I want to say it was 96, but yeah, no, that's... Oh no, it was released in 96. Oh, okay. A little bit too far. So you're you're a little too early. Mm -hmm. But yeah, like the... Yeah. Anyway, uh, moving on to episode three, which was probably my second favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I figured as much. Okay. So now we have mainframe citizens who are mysteriously disappearing, including Dot and Al's, uh, the and the waiter. Uh, yes. Fong hires two CGI special agents who... That's just... I'm so happy with that part alone. <laughs> but we get to meet these two agents, one named Fax Modem, which... Well done, writing team. <laughs> uh, and Data Nully to investigate the, the disappearances along with Bob and Mouse. Uh, mm -hmm. Data and um, Fax are parodies of Fox Mulder and Dana Scully from the X-Files. And they actually got uh, Jillian Anderson to voice uh, Data in this episode, which is pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. And CGI is obviously a reference to the FBI because they... Those characters work for the FBI in the X-Files. Yes. Okay. Uh, they discover the now enlarged invader identified uh, as a creature from the web. The implications of the situation gets worse when the Guardians become aware. So basically, Mouse tells the Guardians that, hey, this thing's from the web. Come help us. And then we find out that maybe they're not coming to help them. Well, they have their methods but they're kind of a little bit more extreme than what they're hoping for. Yes. Because basically the Guardians are like, well, fuck it, we can't really do anything, so we'll just, like, destroy Mainframe. Because the virus is, or the thing from the web is hella strong, and just in case of, there's no easy way to sort of fight it, we just need to nuke it. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, exactly. So now we move into the fourth episode, which is called Web World Wars, which is very difficult to say. Yeah, a lot of W's. There, yes. Um, so there's a portal to the web hovering over mainframe, and its citizens prepare for war. Due to the situation, Bob gives Enzo a commission as a cadet guardian. Megabyte and Hexadecimal uh, join the battle, but they have a secret, secret ulterior motive, where at the near... Well, I'm going to say about a, th about, with about a third left in the episode, they... Uh, shockingly turn on um, Bob and uh, Dot and Mouse and try to yes. use this situation to their advantage to take control of Mainframe. Yes. Okay. I don't know if you heard this joke, but there's a great one. Um, I can't remember exactly when it happens, but... Somebody says a line that says, it's the ABCs they've turned on us. Uh, yes. A um, couple of callback characters from past episodes in season one. The two British pilots that are yes. flying around in their ship. Yes. Which is a reference to uh, ABC not renewing the show for a third season. So they were just <laughs> salty. Uh -huh. Um... Oh, also, there's a part where Megabyte comes up to Mouse uh, and says, uh, Clever Girl, which is a reference to Jurassic Park. Yep, Jurassic Park bringing up us. Yes, so basically the end of the episode involves Bob getting uh, trapped in this, like, I don't even know what to call it. I guess kind of like a missile thing, and he's shot well, into this portal. Yeah, I sort of think, like, escape pod, but just, like, pod to trap him and shoot him up into the web yeah and then that closes the portal to the web and mouse and dot are able to escape but now um megabyte and hex have effectively taken control of mainframe yeah yeah and we don't know where bob is we assume he's dead oh um, yeah got out into the web who knows how that's gonna work 
Yes, and Enzo is now the guardian for Mainframe. Yes. Which So, a particular thing that I heard from person online that kind of works with stories, other sorts of things, brought up a particular sort of trope or idea. I'm not sure if it's too much of... Um, kind of placed as a trope or whatnot from there, but essentially the tone. Like, one of the things I remember you kind of mentioning is, hey, it's a kid's show, there's only so much you can do. Well, with Megabyte pushing the button, you could kiss that goodbye. I mean, it still is a kid's show, but I did enjoy this episode more than I enjoyed a lot of the others. Mm -hmm. Because again, it's going to be a case of the status quo has gone away with all the particular actions of this and things are gonna change as they continue on with the series yeah yeah no and i i enjoyed like megabyte is actually a villain this time okay so in comparison to the other couple of plans that he's either done in the first series or even moving along with that kind of escalating from there it's kind of either hit the precipice or the case of now you really think of him as a villain with what he's done. Yeah, he actually comes across as, like, a good villain now. Because before he was just kind of a bumbling moron. Mm-hmm. For the most part. Like, there were some good villainous moments from him prior to this, but... Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah. Okay. So I suppose out of curiosity, with a couple of episodes that were here, what were your thoughts worth uh, Hexadecimal? I love Hex. I... I... <laughs> Like I've said, I almost wish Hex was the main villain and Megabyte was, like, her lackey. Because mm. Hex is just so much more enjoyable to watch on screen. Because she's so insane. I just, I love the character. Okay. Out of curiosity, did you have any sort of issues with Hexadecimal getting depowered and her relationship with Bob? I mean, not particularly, because I'm like, well, my thing was, uh, okay, now, I don't remember the show, but I did watch it a lot growing up, mm-hmm. um, but I'm like, well, I know that this isn't going to last, because they're going to return Hex to being a major villain at some point, because I remember, like, episodes that we haven't got to, like, there are moments mm-hmm. in my mind where I'm like, okay, we haven't gotten to that, and I know Hex is a major villain in that point, so we have to get back to that point somehow. Mm -hmm. Okay. But I think on whole, it's just the case of Hex's character as a whole is amazing, even despite the fact there are issues where she either gets depowered, uh, certain situations happen to her, but it doesn't either affect the character as much that would not ruin any sort of enjoyability of seeing her play a part in the story. No, and I think part of that is also, like, she isn't in every episode. Mm-hmm. Like, she only pops up every once in a while, and when she pops up, something big happens. Okay. You know, whereas, like, with, with Megabyte, he's in basically every episode. Mm-hmm. And then he's kind of just... They end up making him too much of a buffoon a lot of the time, which I don't really like. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I quite enjoyed these four episodes. Uh, the second three, or the, sorry, three and four were the ones I liked the most. Um, the design of Gigabyte was cool. Um, okay. But, yeah, I mean, the first two episodes are fine. Like, there's okay. some good stuff in them, but I was like, ah, uh, well, the first one, like, I don't love the Power Rangers stuff just because I was never a Power Rangers kid. Okay. Um, I wouldn't say that I'm a tremendously big fan of the Power Rangers series as a whole, but just with the amount of exposure I've had to it, having the toys, having at least experience with it, I at least have somewhat of a fond spot for it, but not to the extent of continuing to follow the series or even looking into the tokusatsu uh, Japanese versions of the series that uh, Power Rangers takes from. Yeah, like I watched Power Rangers like, occasionally Mm. like i had a friend who if i was like if i slept over at their place i would watch it in the morning because he really liked it but Mm. i never went out of my way to watch power rangers Mm. or maybe i did like once in a while still 
always interesting to either see a particular uh, cartoon series or other sorts of things, bring homages to other popular things at the time, either just with name recognition, it will sort of get the, oh my gosh, they're bringing reference to those particular things for the fans or other sorts of things, watching shows like that. And it's one of the particular things that either kind of gives a little bit more of additional inf interest to the show or sort of gives a time frame of where things kind of sit um, with popular sort of things at a time and how it sort of affects uh, shows coming in or other sort of stories that people can come up with. I also, now I don't know this for sure, but I'm also wondering if this wasn't done to increase their toy line. Because it feels like this was done to increase the toy line. Yeah, it probably wouldn't have hurt. Like, again, with the amount of lead characters, the villains, and other particular things that they could use, there's at least a wheeled house of things that they could use for the toy line, but in comparison to other particular series that kind of blow this series out of the water, adding a couple of additional things probably wouldn't have hurt. Though, that can only have so much success in some cases. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna have to... I'm on the reboot, like, wiki. I do not see any of these characters, like, these redesigns as toys. Okay. There are, like, a few variants of, like, the main characters, but there's not, like... I don't see any of these particular... Uh, not, like, the superhero costumes or the yeah. giant robot. Yeah, no. That's a little surprising to me, but... Hey. It also might have been a little bit of a case of since it so much relates to Power Rangers that it may have caught in a little bit of legal issues. Uh, could have done, could have done for sure, but I was pretty sure that they would have tr at least put out the toys. But it, it appears they haven't, although there are some really nice... So, one particular thing that you mentioned, and just to come back to your thought on the thought of Gigabyte and your supposed concern in the past about the supposed relationship between Megabyte and Hexadecimal and just the entire episode of Gigabyte as a whole, did this kind of confirm your theory on things and bring the bad portion to it, or did it take a different spin on things from what you figured? I mean, I figured that they were going to do the whole their brother and sister thing. Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, at least they did that, and it's not something weird. <laughs> okay, like, starting to go into the realm of, ooh, super, sort of weird kind of cases with it. Although they kind of do. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of a marvelous case of you really have to, uh, sus I wouldn't say suspend your disbelief, but kind of put in the thought of, this is in a computer, this is in a computer, this is in a computer. Because they do heavily imply incest. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which ain't a great look, but, you know. Yeah. Again, it's in a computer, it's in a computer, it's in a computer. <laughs> but yeah, I, like, I, I never hated the relationship between them. I was always just like, well, okay, like, of course they're related. Like, okay, whatever. But mm -hmm. it doesn't and bother then... me that much. On the one hand, I'm mildly surprised that you found the character of Gigabyte interesting. Because one of the particular thoughts I had was, at the time, he most likely looked cool. And Kid Me was like, oh my gosh, big new villain. But me seeing it now was kind of like, this is all the traditional tropes of giving you the big new bad guy of the week. Make him bigger and stronger. <laughs> no, I... Like, I... We don't get to spend enough time with the character to really know if he's interesting. I just like the design. Okay. With everything that they did, as well as the additional design that the virus that took over both Hexadecimal and Megabyte is seen on the back, but not really shown in most respects or known to everyone until kind of the last second. Yeah, and I think part of the reason I like the design, and this is going to sound really dumb, is if you look at like his face... It reminds me of Spawn. <laughs> okay, with kind of the typical mask design, white face against a black. Yeah, with the, like, green around the eyes and stuff. I'm like, that reminds me a lot of Spawn. 
Okay. And again, I think you also brought up a couple of other typical designs of his uh, right claw hand sort of ring referencing to Freddy. Yes. Uh, and those sort of characteristics. Yeah, his his one, his hand definitely reminds me of Freddy, who mm-hmm. I'm also a big fan of Freddy, so that definitely didn't hurt. Mm-hmm. I suppose another particular thought is that within these couple series of episodes, there was greater screen time given to Hack and Slash. So <laughs> out of curiosity, uh, what did you think of those particular interactions? I love Hack and Slash. Hack and Slash are the best. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I suppose with the first uh, showing in uh, Nelzilla with them babysitting Scully and then going to look for him while all this stuff was happening. Yeah, I just... See, Hack and Slash, I like because they're bumbling idiots, but we're supposed to think they're bumbling idiots. Mm-hmm. Like, they're not they're not threatening. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, they're the least threatening villains ever. And that's why yeah. I like them, because they're just bumbling idiots. My problem with Megabyte a lot of the time is he's, like, barely more competent than they are. So he never feels like a good villain. Okay. At least in like okay. these episodes, they actually make Megabyte like a good villain. But that's why I like Hack and Slash is because, yeah, they're dumb, bumbling idiots and they're fun. But we're mm, not supposed okay. to take them as actual threats. Okay, okay. Give those ones from there. So I suppose the big question within these couple of episodes: What were your thoughts with? Andrea with a char- as a character within these couple of episodes, and especially with Enzo, with how things transferred from the three of four episodes. Okay, so I feel like uh, Andrea doesn't really do much. Like, she's part of the whole, like, Power Rangers knockoff thing. But I feel like mm-hmm. other than that, she doesn't really do much. Like she's no, not- that's understandable. Like, at the very most, it's a case of... We have the character, but she doesn't really fit within the status quo. So it's a little bit of, we're not sure what to do with her. But nevertheless, there's at least a scene or two within each one of the episodes where she has a speaking line, has something to do within the episode, but it isn't really focused on. It's a little bit side. Yeah, I feel like with her, for the, like you could take her out of these episodes and nothing would really change. Okay. Um, let's, okay, now let's talk about Enzo. Because, yeah. as has been well documented, I have not liked Enzo. Because yeah. he's an annoying little Our shit. Character. Because he's an annoying little shit, and I want to punt him. <laughs> However, I will give credit where credit is due. I thought that they actually built up to Enzo become a gar- becoming a guardian quite well. Okay. Okay. They they um they they uh planted the seeds earlier when they met Andrea and they've like the, the, there was actually like a story arc there. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, I actually don't hate that. I think that's actually probably that was handled fairly well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I I I'm like I don't like Enzo because a lot of the time I find him annoying, but in these episodes I'm like, oh no, he's actually not being annoying. He's actually, I'm not going to say he's cool in this, but I understand why, like, kids would like him at least based off of these episodes, because he's at Mm -hmm. least competent. Okay, yeah. It's a bit of a case of, he still has the bit of personality of him being a kid, little bits of impulsiveness, and still being Enzo at his core, but with how the situation arises, his experiences, and especially with him gaining the responsibilities of being a guardian, it pushes things along a little bit more that, yeah, have to take responsibility and do things. But it's also a case of he's not too much of a main player within the story. He's definitely one of the side characters and helps out within the situation, but it's also kind of a little bit too big for him with the episodes that we've run through. Yeah, but they're also kind of... They're all, the way that this... Uh, the episode... like the It's basically a movie. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, The way that this ends is they are implying, at least, that next season um, Enzo would become a main character because we don't know where Bob is. So at least for a couple episodes, uh, I'm assuming, uh, Enzo will be the main guardian for um, um, Mainframe. Yes. Or sorry, Megaframe, as it is now known, because uh, Megabyte has renamed it. Well, it isn't that quite yet. It's a Megabyte has kind of set his intentions, but Fong and just about everyone else is like, Haha, no, let's maybe not do that. We're going to try our best to stop you. Yeah. So I don't hate the idea of Enzo maybe getting a couple episodes where he's like trying to be a guardian, but mm-hmm. I hope Bob comes back quickly ish. Like, I'm not saying do it in episode one. I'm saying do it in, like, episode four or five. Something like that. Yeah, like, give Enzo a couple episodes to try and fail, and then have Bob mm -hmm. come back to kind of save the day. Okay. Because one of the particular questions I had for you was, like, were you tremendously concerned with Enzo kind of taking Bob's position at the moment for being the defender of Mainframe? And you've kind of answered that already. But... I think with re-watching these episodes in my case, there was one particular interaction in World and Web World Wars that Megabyte has with Mouse while she's doing her job. And Megabyte asks if or what specifically Mouse was kind of doing. And the general plan was to make it so that mainframe was very difficult to reconnect to while from the web that they were fighting against. And Mouse being Mouse is fairly good with making passwords and making sure that nothing kind of gets through under her watch. And that line sort of stuck out to me of kind of, hmm, I think this is a little concerning. Okay, well, so my thing is, I I assume, I'm, I'm going to make an assumption here based off of um, these episodes, that I'm assuming that because Mouse is the one who kind of, like, effectively created the, uh, I don't know how to phrase this, but is effectively the one that cut them off from uh, the web, mm-hmm. that, like, her, like, Bob is going to, uh, uh, be able to come up with like a password or whatever based off of knowing Mouse. Like that she would have okay. programmed that code as like something Bob would know. That's my okay. assumption. Not quite honestly even with the experiences in that the history that Mouse has with Bob that no I see that within their characters. She would make some back doors and other sorts of things for people that she knows to help out in those sort of situations. That definitely isn't too concerning. Though, with speaking of Mouse, it brings up the additional thought. How did you feel about, I suppose, one, Mouse being back and more within the story, but additionally, her relationship with Dot? Okay, so first off, I think I've said this before, but I really like Mouse because Mm -hmm. A, cool design, uh, and B, I just like her as a character. I like her relationship with Bob, and I quite enjoyed her relationship with Dot because they both kind of, they both kind of hate each other, but they also kind of like each other. Yeah, kind of the marvelous case of two girls meet up, man, sort of sitting in the middle, but not really fighting over him. But kind of the, I'm not sure if you could call it cattiness that they have between each other, but just the case that they're not on the same page as it is, but they're capable enough and respectful enough to work together to do certain things and through that sort of trusting and working together that they build that sort of relationship that they're good girl pals now and it's like yes yeah i don't i i quite enjoy their relationship because they are kind of they're not friends but they like they can work together Mm. yeah no I, i quite enjoyed that All right. Supposed to, one last thought I had with this episode is, what's your thoughts on Mike the TV? 
Oh, see, again, Mike the TV, when he first came into the show, was not one of my favorites. Understandable. He is slowly growing on me, though. Okay. Okay. He's less annoying now than he was at the beginning. Okay. Okay. I wish that they gave him more chances to do stupid TV parodies, because I'm like, that's clearly what this character should be for. Mm-hmm. But uh, we haven't got as much of that as I would have liked. But I don't hate him. Like, he's okay. fine, but he should definitely remain a minor character. Radios. So what are your feelings that he essentially caused this entire series of events to happen? I mean, did he? Well, he pretty much did. Again, Bob's brilliant idea of leaving Mike the TV with hexadecimal, since that was supposedly the best option. Mike the TV does his job, shows TV programs with him showing a playoff of the wife of Frankenstein to hexadecimal, and then her reaction of, I've seen this already! I liked it. Yeah, I don't think you can really blame Mike the TV, though. Like, he didn't really... I suppose, with watching it over again, I sort of knew the situation of how everything sort of transpired, but I'm not sure if I would be on the seat of the entire situation was Mike's fault for what happened. It was a marvelous case of Hex wanted to see something else, and just blindly he happened to turn to the particular channel that was showing an opera singer, which came with the obvious result. Oh, yeah. The multitude of things that were there shattered the mirror and opened up the portal way that Hexadecimal had in her mirror that would connect to the web and the web thing coming in through it. Yeah. I don't love how they got to the whole web portal thing, but I do enjoy the rest of it. Mm. But yeah, I thought that these episodes were, for the most part, pretty good. In the case of ending off the series and kind of giving a real shake-up to the status quo of what sort of storyline they have in mind. Well, and I think this also, um, because they were cancelled by ABC at the time, I feel mm-hmm. like this was probably originally intended to be a series finale. Because mm-hmm. they didn't know that they were going to get picked up by another network. I want to see Cartoon Network or something. Uh, would yeah, Lake would pick the them up. Series picked them up from there. Yeah, so I mean... I thought it was fine. Mm-hmm. Alrighty. Did you have any other thoughts on these these episodes? No. I think of the most with coming to the end of season two. Just the one side of it of, oh my gosh, this series went by so quick with being technically halfway through it. And the case of with how long it kind of lasted and the amount of reruns that they supposedly did on television with the period of time that they had with it, just the series seemed so much bigger when I was a kid, but now sort of looking at it, it was like, damn, a person could binge this entire thing on a streaming site and get the entire series within a good day or two, which is some cases understandable, but also other cases there's some series on there that they're taking a good couple of weeks to get through, but also not a very good lifestyle choice as it sits. Yeah, so we go into season three. Uh, The first episode is To Mend and Defend, which makes sense. Um, I'm super excited because of who the writer is on this episode. Oh, but this coming up one? Yes. Uh, I don't know if this name will mean anything to you, but it's written by Marv Wolfman. Nothing immediately that's jumping okay. out with that. Uh, Marv Wolfman is primarily known for being a comic book writer. Oh, okay. Um, he wrote, like, um, Crisis on Infinite Earths with George Perez. Uh, he did the New Teen Titans. He created, like, a ton of characters. Super well known for being a, um, like, a comic book writer. Uh <laughs> There's a fun, I'll tell you a fun Marv Wolfman story when we record the next episode. Remind me about that. Um, And he also wrote for like a bunch of TV shows too. 
Uh, he did, obviously, Reboot. He did uh, Beast Wars. He worked on Spider-Man the Animated Series. He worked on Transformers and, like, a whole bunch of other stuff. So, okay, going in from there. And there's, like, a ton of comic book writers that are on the writing team this year. Hmm. Which is really interesting to me. No, kind of taking a quick glance at uh, Wolfman here, as well as kind of thinking on it, it's not too surprising with a couple storylines that I can very vividly remember in my mind through the next couple of seasons that, yeah, comic book writers probably got their hands on the series that had one heck of a heyday with it. Yeah, there's there's a lot of comic book writers that are that are apparently joining the writing team this year. Mm -hmm. So that will be interesting. Indeed. So until next time, I'm Paul. And I'm Dave.